there already that you've seen that the second assignment is posted. If it's not due this Friday, as I wish we had planned up, uh, so these are them asking to rather have assignments due uh, at the first the beginning of the week, so I've, I've let that happen so you've got the weekend and a lot to work on that. If you are having any like Google Docs, just to, uh, I'm getting a lot of Google Docs, but obviously with the 4M course and then also the first one, uh, to help manage that uh, tracking of the assignment, can you please make sure that your group names are in the, or at least certainly your last names are in the title of your Google Docs? Um, and then also the uh, 4 and 3, so I can uh, make sure that you are filtered correctly. And then if you can share that with the TA's Gmail address, Daryl's created a, an email for this course. Um, a little bit long, but uh, it's up there. Please write it down. I'll post it also on the course website. If you do choose to use Google Docs, uh, you don't have to. Uh, if you use Google Docs, you will not receive any paper. It will be you hand in electronically, Daryl will grade electronically, and so there's no paper. Um, you don't have to worry about the students going to sync or getting them back or coming to class or picking up or even having to come to class at 8.30 to hand them in. Um, so that's one advantage, but it is a bit harder to do, um, it takes maybe a bit longer to do things like equations and stuff. But uh, I've seen what a lot of people have been doing, they do the whole thing, they scan it in and uh, put the scan image in and people talk about this. So, Um, I had ended off the last class with some questions, and I just to, for the material that I'd like to cover today to keep things coherent on this new section, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a solution to that question on the course website. So on the course website, you may have noticed there's a section for uh, practice questions for tests and exams. I'll be adding questions over there. This will be uh, the question from last class will be one that we'll I'll post today with a with the full solution. So you will get to see. We're only going to look at it in today uh, on particle size distribution analysis. So, how many of you are comfortable with particle size distribution curves? Have you seen it in other courses? I wasn't quite sure if you've seen it maybe in public courses. Some of you want to Yeah? So, you're used to the concept of uh, cut size, the general union, the D50, D80. Okay, so we'll, uh, I, I won't cover D50, D80 today. Seems, I thought that would be something that you would be familiar with, so I'll, I'll maybe pick that up next part. Um, what we're really just going to look at here is, is why um, particle size distribution is important. It's going to come, come into the rest of the course quite a bit, so I thought that we could cover it in today's class. Now, there's three characteristics of solids that are important. One is their composition, uh, which we're going to assume that they're uniform for the most part, and the composition obviously affects the physical properties of that solid. But then there's two other things that impact how we work with them as engineers, how they flow and how we deal with them in separation systems particularly, are uh, their shape and size properties. So we're going to look at, um, look at some of those concepts first. Now, we very naively assumed in the previous section that our particle is of a single diameter, which, and, and most spherical as well. So, so two key assumptions which are never true. We'll always deal with the particle size distribution, so we're going to have a variety of diameters, even if we're working with perfect spheres. And then secondly, we're not going to always use perfect spheres. Um, we're going to be dealing with very irregular shaped particles. So how do we apply our engineering theory to these irregular shaped particles? Well, when it comes to, to that, we're going to characterize or describe, so we use this characterized term that makes it journal publication sound a little fancy, but really it's just saying we're going to describe the particle size by some distribution curve, characterized by some distribution curve. Um, there's a question obviously how do we get that distribution, but we'll take a little, a, a short look at that. Um, by no means a, a comprehensive look, it's, it's, that's a very big topic on its own, how particle sizes are measured. And then we'll try to answer this question, what's an average particle size that we should be using? So let's just talk about uh, shape first. Um, so particles, there's two types of particles that we like to work with as engineers. One is spherical and one is cubic because they're so easy. We can get equations for them. We can do, derive theoretical models uh, quite easily with those two uh, shaped particles. But we, we're not going to see that in fact. So what we're going to see are irregularly shaped particles. So this is 
something in the order of uh, the consistency of broken glass, jam, or even if you're in food manufacturing, how do you deal with chicken strips? How do you characterize the size of a chicken strip if you were to work with food, for example, or uh, pepperoni slices, or deboned chicken? Um, like, so there's, there's solids handling that, that you will come across, and you, it's important to be able to characterize the size. These things are sold based on some sort of size dimensions, upper and lower bounds, and shape that the end customer wants to see. How do we characterize and describe uh, some of those things? Um, so, so that's particle size and, and why, why that's important. <coughs> uh, the shape, I mean, uh, particle size is important because you will, this first one is a quote from Perry's, um, though I've, I've heard this often, or something along these lines, they say, after crushing a particular feed, um, in several stages, so the several multiple stages of crushing, from a size of five to six centimeters coming in, we get a powder that's 75 to 90 percent passing a 200 mesh seed. What does that mean, and how, what, what do we take, take out of that sentence? Uh, as I said, we're going to deal with solids no matter where you work. Uh, you will, will very likely be dealing with solids. There's very few industries that are exclusively uh, fluid-based, uh, like so they're looking at air products, or the gas industry, that could be an exception. Oil, uh, oil and petrochemicals tends to be a well, well, even in petrochemicals, you still have to deal with catalysts and packed beds. But for the most part, uh, most of you will see solids and how you have to, you have to describe them. If you were working in the drug industry, um, the activity, how fast that biological drug acts in your body is strongly a function of its particle size. Um, and then this was an interesting one I learned yesterday, um, hiding power. So if you ever get into paints or pigments, uh, they have a metric that they use in that industry called the hiding powers, which is when you apply a coat of paint to a wall or a surface, how much does it hide the underlying, the original color that it was uh, placed over. So the hiding power of the paint is a, is a function of particle size. So paints are, are very, are just polymers, latex paints, for example, and they're just, they're, they're made to meet a certain particle size distribution. So, so that's important from your future career perspective. But then with this course, uh, our next section on filtration is going to uh, assume particle size distributions, flows of fluids, fluids of packed beds and membranes, obviously all of these things are related to the size of Now, up here is, uh, I put just, just as a reference, we, we have a good idea of particle size, especially with everyday products that we deal with. For example, uh, the powder detergent that you put in your washing machine. Uh, that's in the order of a uh, thousand <coughs> microns. Uh, spray dried products, so I don't use <coughs> powdered milk here in Canada, but powdered milk, uh, powdered, those type of products, powdered sugar, flour, toners. And, and powder ceramics. Now we're getting to the smaller particles that we, we're uh, seeing every day. Uh, so we don't look at the toner coming out of our printer, but those are the order of the size of the particles that are used to print on the front paper. Um, and then much, much smaller as we get to the bottom of the list. So in, in the engineering industry where we're dealing with flowing solid streams, we'll probably be dealing with 10 to 5 down to 10 to 1. And then some of the more niche industries and, and fine chemicals. And in fact, as we get to that bottom of the list, it's, it's quite hard to really measure the particle size. So here, in, in the order of one micron, 0 0.01 and 0 0.001 microns, those are incredibly hard to measure. So we, when we're looking at particle size measurement systems, we'll be tending to focus from that region of about one micron upwards. Um, it, it can come, come to be quite easily measured with commercial laboratory equipment. Take a look at, at irregularly shaped particles. What uh, what we try to do is we try to bring everything back to the reference <coughs> sphere. So for a very good approximation in many engineering systems, if we've got irregular shaped particles, if we can calculate the equivalent diameter that a sphere would have, and then use that diameter in our calculations, we're not going to be too badly off. So that's the general principle. So one way to try and define how much different the particle is from the sphere, we define this, this uh, ratio called sphericity. So uh, 
the sphericity is defined up there, it's a bit of a mouthful, so let's take a look at it. It says surface area of the sphere with the same volume as the particle. So we've got our particle that we're interested in, we get its volume, and then we ask, uh, what would be the surface area of the sphere that had that volume? And then that's our numerator, our denominator is then the actual surface area of the particle. So if the particle we were dealing with originally was a sphere, the sphericity would be one. So the upper bound is 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 as close to a sphere as you can have. So that's great, that's a great particle to have. Because once we have a particle that's very close to a sphere's behavior, we can use all those easy equations we have derived from Stokes um, in the last section of the course. Uh, we know also, of course, that as I put up at the top there, that spheres, they have the same way of behaving no matter which angle we're looking at it from. So that's a, that's a great property to have. If you can measure the sphericity of a particle and it's close to one, we really can then keep using all, that, all those equations we've, we've, we've had quite comfortably. There, gentlemen, here's a question for you to try at home. You can go verify for yourself that the sphericity of a cube, which has equal lengths and all the sides which you see of, of length C, that if you uh, put that into that equation over there, there is that C term will cancel out in the numerator and the denominator. Uh, the sphericity resolves to about 0.8. Um, I'll have you work out the, the sphericity, for example, of a needle-shaped object. So what, if we took a long rectangular-shaped uh, object, what would be the sphericity of that? So, uh, so, that, so give that one a try. It's not hard to show that the sphericity is 0.8. And then we'll try some others in the assignment. So the nice thing is that if we've got particles that uh, tend to be close to one, we, we can just keep using our other equations. Now, what we then try to do is, if we, if we don't have the sphericity close to one, then we realize, okay, well, we don't have this shape particle. But one thing we then go and do instead is we say, well, if I have a particle that's not spherical, can I go find an equivalent spherical diameter? And there's many such diameters. So, for example, you could go find the diameter of the sphere that has the same volume as the particle, or the same surface area, or surface area per unit volume. And you would pick the one from that list that, would, that mattered more to the problem at hand. So for packed beds, the, the, the volume of the packing is going to be an important part, uh, point in that system. So then you may pick a diameter that has the same volume as um, in, in applications where, which are mass transfer limited, you're now interested in mass moving or, or coming into a surface area, then you would want to rather use a diameter that more closely matches the surface area of the particle. So the equivalent spherical diameter that has the same surface area as the particle. So for each one of these, whatever word you plug into that open space, you'll get a different diameter, a different equivalent spherical diameter, and you would use that diameter then to characterize or work in your, in your equations. So if you go look back at your notes for, um, for, I think, the second and third year, where whenever you cover mass transfer, then you will look at pack beds, and there's, there's often an assumption that things are spherically shaped. What is the diameter that you use there when you're really not using the spheres? So that you would use one of these equivalent diameters. We've, in fact, used one of that earlier on in this, in, uh, so for the projected area um, in the direction of travel, the, di the drag diameter, where we were deriving the equation, uh, that, that would be the equivalent diameter to use there for a non-spherical particle. Um, or you could, uh, the, you could find, there's another one where you could say, well, what, let me find a particle that has the same settling velocity as, as, as a perfectly, I've got a perfectly spherical particle, a perfectly spherically shaped particle, and then I've got my irregular shaped particle. If I uh, settle those, I can calculate the settling velocity, then that calculates what the equivalent spherical diameter would be under the idea of Stokes behavior. And then the last one is what we'll use today is find the diameter of the sphere that has the same size that you fit through a square aperture on a C. Um, so that's, that's, these are alternative metrics that we're going to use. The last one today is not going to have a discussion on particle size, but we look at, at some Cs of it. Okay, so any question on, on size characterization? We're not going to do too much about it, other than just to put it out there that there's these alternatives. But any any discussion or ideas or concerns here on this topic? So a lot of it does require knowing, obviously, the surface area and volume of your regular shape. Part.
article and then just back it up with the equivalent. Right? And that, that, that can actually be quite hard to compute. Surface area of, of irregularly shaped particles can be phenomenally difficult uh, to, to calculate. Okay, so then we'll move on to particle size characterization. So that uh, first part there was particle shape. Now let's look at particle size, which is the, the main part of today's class. Uh, so here's a photo of the screen that I have in front here in the class. So um, this is called a mesh 10 screen. It has two millimeter openings in the in the hole. So I'll just put it up here on the projector in front uh, so you can see those, those openings. And then most of you are going to are familiar with these types of screens, right? You, you may have seen them in lab or something.
or the mass, I should say, all the, of the material being retained on each screen. That's what we're after. So this, this, the shape work of the duration so that, that you're getting a fair poly precise distribution measurement. So if you shape were too short, you're going to get smaller material left on some of the upper seeds that really should have been on one of the lower seeds. So, so that's, that's an important point. The other is related to intensity of shaping. If you shape too intensely, especially for fragile particles, you're going to actually create breakage in the seeds and bias your distribution. So that's uh, to, to, to the lower end. So that's obviously not, not, not advisable either. So there's a balance that you have to strike. If you, if you obviously don't shape hard enough, you're not going to move your solids around so that they can fall through the seed openings. The other thing to mention here is that smaller particles will tend to stick to larger ones. So you have to dislodge them. And if you don't shake intensely enough, then you're not going to be able to dislodge them. So again, there's no, there's no fixed advice on how much, how long you should shake for and how aggressively you should shake. So in other words, what's the net energy you should be putting into the system to, to get the particle size distribution fairly measured? It's, it's, it's not, it's not, there's no guidance that says you must do this or you should do this. Um, one thing to realize also is, especially for particles that do tend to stick, uh, there are special equipment that one can use which uses uh, wet screening to, to use the fluid to dislodge the smaller particles off the larger ones and wash, wash them down to the appropriate seed. Um, but then the disadvantage is now you've got wet material that you're supposed to have to dry before you do your weighing step. So, so there is an advantage of the wet screening, but the disadvantage is that, that you have to dry the water off, off the solids first. Um, you have to dry all that water off and um, then do your Okay, so has anyone done any one of these uh, screening measurements in the lab? Yeah? <coughs> in the pharmaceutical industry? Or uh, when I was working for the Brown Institute, we were doing double loop. I was sitting still shaking in the day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, so I think one of you about it is it's not, <laughs> it's, it's a very brain dead type of exercise. I think you've done it once or twice. Um, but it's important to understand what the, what the factors are that are uh, related to each seed. Now, that's one measurement, and the standard measurement has been done for hundreds of years. I mean, since the gold mining industry started, uh, that's the standard metric that's used to, to, to measure particle size. But there's, there's a number of others that could be used. Um, one is actually sedimentation. So we've, we've learned uh, about sedimentation in the previous section. One, there's a laboratory equipment that one can purchase that does sedimentation and you, you, you mix up your material, let it settle down in your, in your container, and then you use a pipette at various layers, at various heights down the, the sedimentation tube, and you withdraw a sample of the solids at that particular level down, down the sedimentation. And you, you weigh it, weigh it out, filter it out, and weigh out the solids. Because we know where, for a, for a theoretical sedimentation, assuming it's no smaller than spherical particles, we know where certain diameters should be at a certain time based on their thermal shaping velocity. So if we place our pipette sample to withdraw at those particular points, we can then measure the particle size. Another one that's also quite interesting is um, on some sedimentation units, you can put a, an immersed scale inside the sedimentation and then weigh the mass of solids that are coming onto the scale multiple times per second over a period of time. And then based on theoretical calculations, you can back calculate what the diameters would have been that would have settled at those particular points of time. So using the theory we already learned about last class, the last section, uh, we, can, we can do that. The other thing that's really interesting is, is infiltration, which is just sedimentation in reverse. So if you took a sample of solids and you suspended it in, in liquid, so starting with that, and then instead of allowing that mixture to settle down with gravity, what if you took fluid and pushed it up? So the particles are trying to settle down based on gravity, but I've got a fluid stream flowing upwards, counteracting that flow. And 
And if I set that fluid stream's velocity that's counteracting the solid's terminal setting velocity exactly equal, that solid particle is going to be suspended in 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 the in the medium, in the liquid medium. And if I increase the fluid velocity, I'm going to start to push certain diameters of particles up. So if I start off slowly enough, I'm going to get to a point where I'm just suspending all my solids. And they're just staying stable, with all the force up, canceling the force down. As I start to increase that velocity of the fluid, I'm going to start to drive my smallest diameter particles up, and they're going to leave out in the fluid stream. I can capture them, filter them out, and weigh the mass of them for that known velocity going up. And then I can keep increasing my fluid velocity up, the upward direction, until I eventually drive all my solids up. And so as I keep driving my velocity up, I can plot a function of velocity versus mass captured. And that velocity upwards that I set in my, in my uh, container there is exactly just take my, my Stokes equation that we've seen previously, assuming the general one is below one. Flip it around and solve for zp. And now my terminal setting velocity is going to is where the point at which my terminal setting velocity matches my fluid velocity, I can back calculate what the coolant diameter is that's just suspended there in the, in the fluid. Okay, so this is a really neat idea of, of trying to back, back calculate the diameters um, based on, on the fluid velocity. So that's a standard step, it's called denutriation. And the fluid that you could use could either be air or, or, or liquid of some sort. Uh, as long as you know the physical properties of that. Now the hardest part of the nutrition, what would you guess might be a, an issue at play if you were trying to push fluid up at a certain velocity and keep that velocity constant? What, what would be some of the issues you'd face? Turbulence. And if we're, if we take this equation, this comes from the Stokes region where Reynolds one is below one, so we shouldn't have turbulence. But what the other issue would you have? Get like parabolic flow. Exactly. We have a parabolic velocity profile, and not a, a, a constant. There's not a single constant velocity profile in that in the tube coming up. So the hardest part of nutrition is putting diffusers in in your system to try and diffuse out that parabolic profile and get it roughly the constant everywhere. So that's one option. Uh, there's another one, permeability methods. Uh, we'll learn about this in our next section on filtration, where the flow rate through a permeable membrane is proportional to the pressure drop that we, we create. And then that, that proportionality constant is a function of the surface area divided by unit volume. So if we can calculate, we know our flow, we know our delta P, we can then back calculate the equivalent spherical diameter and we satisfy that proportionality. <coughs> And then the final method that is probably the most widely used now is this laser diffraction. So Google laser diffraction, we get some interesting pictures for how it works, but the principle is that you take a laser beam and you, 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 you point it at a particle, so if this is a laser beam pointing at a particle, it will, if this is a small particle, that angle at which the laser beam diffracts versus a larger particle, those angles are very different. And if you have a device behind it that measures the diffraction angles, uh, where that laser beam intensity hits, uh, you can then back calculate what the particle size will be. And this handles a, a, a very wide range of particle sizes. And the really nice thing is that this can be applied in, in real time. So you can put these devices inside a pipe or instrument onto a, onto a pipe that's carrying your solid fluid mixture and measure in real time what the particle size distribution is moving across that pipe. So you don't have to withdraw a sample, send it to the lab, have it prepare it, do it on a steam shaker for 20 to 30 minutes. This one is real time and can be used for process control. So if you've got an upstream system that's grinding your particles and that particle size needs to be a certain profile, you can then have real time feedback control to keep your particle size distribution where you need it. So uh, and obviously these systems are, are far more expensive than SFCs. So, um, so, so different, different methods, there's a, a whole variety of others, and if this is something that interests you, please, uh, uh, there's Perry's or some other references that I've got mentioned here at the end that uh, would be useful. Okay, so let's, um, let's now talk about what we do with these particle size distributions. So as I mentioned, we will uh, put, let's just take sieve analysis as
as, as, as one example, but all the other methods will get you the same sort of data table. At the end, you will, you will have, for a certain aperture size and the seeds, you will have the mass retained. So you either have the mass directly in the grams, or you will have a percentage of some sort. So either way up, either way is a good one. And then what we want to do is we want to, to plot that. Now, what's happened here? If we have a seed of 1,180 aperture size, that's the size of particles, the mass that of 9.1 9 grams, and the mass retained on the seed. So those particles are larger than 1180. They're not smaller than 1180. They're definitely larger than 1180. They are smaller, though, than the seed above it. So they're smaller than 1400. They're larger than 1180. Which diameter do we assign to it? In the average. Okay, so we just simply say the average size of those those 9.81 grams of material is the, the arithmetic average of those two values. So that's where the 1290 comes from. So some books will use the, the arithmetic average, 1180 plus 1400 divided by 200. Textbooks will use 1180 times 1400, and you take the square root of that. You get roughly the same number. It's not that big a deal. So sometimes people will say use the arithmetic average, other people will say use the geometric average. The numerical effect of Okay, and then from that we can calculate 9.1 grams. We started off with 491 grams total in the system. 9.81 grams was retained. We can calculate what's called the cumulative percent passing. So what the cumulative mass that passed through the 1180 seed is, is obviously 491 minus 9.1 grams divided by 491. So that gets you your 98.1% cumulative percent passing through the through that seed size. But far more interesting than a table of numbers is a plot of it instead. So here on the left hand side, I have the differential analysis. So this says, take my average screen size, so that 1290, and plot the 9.81 divided by 491. So 9.81 divided by 491, that gives me my percentage mass retained on the seed, on an approximate seed of 1290 microns. So I plot that value over there. Then my next particle size, my next one, let's take a look at the fourth one. So that's at an average size of, so it's, this is the mass material resting on the 600 micron seed. The average of 850 plus 600 is 725. The, the 235 grams retained on that average size divided by 491 is just below 50%. And so that's where that value comes from. So the differential analysis is, is literally just takes the mass left on each seed, plotted against the, or the percentage of mass retained on each seed, plotted against the seed size. That's the differential analysis. The cumulative analysis is, is, is exactly what it is. It's, it's saying, saying, well, rather than plotting the actual percentage mass, it's plotting I should plot the percentage cumulative passing against the actual seed size. So 100% of material, material passed through the 1400 micron seed. 98% of my material passed through the 1180. So here, I don't use the average seed size, I use the actual aperture size and plot the corresponding cumulative percent of mass that passed through that seed diameter, or through that seed aperture. And that gives me my green curve. So it's always got this S shape. The blue curve is the percent retained. Um, so that's the percent retained above a certain size. It's just 100% minus the green curve. So that, they, they will always intersect at the 50 50 point. Uh, so the blue curve really not used too much. We're more interested in that green curve, the percent passing. And then we're often interested in the first derivative of that curve with respect to particle size. So if I call this capital F of X, my percent passing curve, that S shape, the derivative of it with respect to particle size, so DF DX, is then really the differential curve. So what some people go and do is they flip their cumulative curve, they, oh, sorry, they calculate their cumulative curve, they, then they fit an equation that, that matches that line, and then they take the analytical derivative of that equation as the lowercase f of x to get a differential curve. But we, we, that, 
that's one option, but one is to recognize that our data, we can actually have lowercase m of x. We have our differential values that maps retain them from c. So uh, we can just calculate it directly. But, so theoretically, we have those relationships. And then in the next slide over here, it gives you a bit, uh, um, shows exactly that same concept on a, on a smoother, smoother curve. So we have to recognize, of course, that in practice, we never get exactly smooth S-shaped curves. We will certainly never see um, our percent retained as a smooth curve like that. It's always going to be very discretized. And given the fact that our particle, our mesh, meshes are not evenly spaced in my mind, they're related by that factor of two to the, to the fourth root, this, the spacing along your horizontal axis is not even as well. That spacing is actually going to get wider and wider higher up you go. So one thing that's often done is people will then plot this on a logarithmic x-axis to, to undo that. Only That's only done though when your particle sizes span a very, very wide range. If they're spanning a, a moderate size, there's no need to use a long x-axis. In fact, I haven't used one yet in this situation. So if you've got a very wide particle size distribution, you may want to choose a logarithmic So as well, we'll have in the next assignment, um, you'll have a, a chance to construct your own plot from a, from the from a table of data, and this is obviously done in, in the spreadsheet, and then, uh, it's quite straightforward. <coughs> now, one thing to point out is <coughs> over here. We have our, our, our smallest mesh was 140 mesh size. So that aperture is 106 microns, it's relatively small. But on the, on the scale of, of, of mesh sizes, uh, we can go right down to 170, 200 mesh, and then the, the most finest mesh that you can purchase uh, is 450 mesh. So that's an opening of 32 microns, incredibly tiny. So there's a there's no need to read all of these pans if your particle size distribution doesn't go with it. So what, what, what's done in the stack is we'll, we'll place the smallest mesh that we expect to see at the bottom, and then we have a solid pan at the bottom. So that will capture anything that goes through your smallest C. Obviously, there's, there may or, or, or may not, depending on, on how far you've gone, there may be some mass that lands up in that pan. So in this case, we, we receive 0.5 grams. So what I've done over here is I've calculated the average of 106 plus zero and I've put it at 53. What some people do, and this has a minor effect on the calculations, is they will, rather than put pan there, they'll put the next C down. So it would be, in this case, the 170 C, and its particle size isn't zero, it's, uh, I think it's over here, let's take a look. So 170 is going to be a 90 micron opening. So instead of putting zero there, they'll put 90. And then that average will be the average of 106 and 90, and then we'll use that value over there. So, so that's just a minor, a minor point. Um, the other point to come back to is I had said at the start, we often will put at the very top the C through which we expect 100% of the material to pass. So we'll, we'll always go one mesh higher where 100% of the material will pass. And that, that's again done so that we can calculate a reasonable average to put over there. So we use the mesh one above, um, and then we can compute that average of 0 0.290. If we, if we didn't have that mesh, we would, uh, we would struggle to put an average particle size over there. So those are just some minor details. When you're working with actual data, that what happens on the end point, on the, on the bottom boundary, we use, instead of the pad, we will use the, the next smallest mesh size, and at the top, boundary, we will use the larger one mesh size above. Um, so those are, those are minor details we need to take into account. Okay, so if we looked at that distribution then, what would we say is the average diameter?
subject to a clock survey 750 microns, and you're basing that on looks like a normal distribution. It's, that doesn't <laughs> 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 sort of. I mean, that does. Uh, you can infer it. Um, so it, this is exactly the problem we have with particle size distribution. Firstly, let's take a look at what we're doing here. We're trying to take a whole sequence of numbers, nine, ten numbers, and we're trying to summarize them by one number. Okay, so that's the, that's our first problem. Actually, is tr that we, we we feel we have a need to reduce a set of data down to one number to summarize it. Okay. Uh, it's like calculating your grade average for your university transcript. Right? We feel like we need to summarize everything you've done here by one single number, which I find ridiculous. So same thing here, we're trying to summarize this whole distribution by one quantity. That's the problem. Um, you, can, you can calculate two very differently shaped distributions and compute the same mean. Okay. So, so same way as I can find a student who has got a very wide distribution in grades and students who have very narrow distribution in grades and they have the same mean. It doesn't, there's, there's, there's something else that we need there to go with it and that was the spread. Or the, the, the how much the, the movement is across around that center point. So, so Sean said that one good average would be 750, and I would, I would agree with that. Um, now, there's other averages that are available. Um, there's the mean, there's the median, and then there's the mode. Those are those are three standard measurements of central tendency that we can compute. Um, so, in, in this case, you can choose the tray that has the, the greatest percent mass retained as a crude estimate. But there's other more detailed ones. Um, the arithmetic mean actually in this instance comes down to, to a fairly small number, 318 microns, surprisingly. We use the definition of the arithmetic mean. Uh, there's the volume weighted mean diameter, there's the surface weighted mean diameter, and then there's the mass or weight weight uh, mean diameter. So each one of these appear at different points along the x-axis. My intention for introducing this topic here isn't to go into what each one of those means um, are or describe them, other than to put it out there that there are a variety of them and we would tend to use the mean diameter that makes the most sense for the application we're dealing with. So some guidance on, on that. Which mean should I use? Well, my, my opinion is, is always use the distribution itself where possible. So, if you're trying to solve questions related to sedimentation, or as you'll see in next uh, next week of coming up, we're going to start looking at filtration. Rather than assuming I've got a single mean diameter in my system and, and designing my system based on that, is why not repeat your design calculations in a spreadsheet or in software that does it for the different distribution sizes, and then use an app use use those results to see what your lower bound and upper bound on the design is going to be. Uh, very often it will just be the, the lower bound of the particle size that's going to be your limiting factor, but it could also sometimes be your upper bound and the particle size that's your limiting factor. So my tendency is not to use a single number, but to use the distribution itself. Um, when it comes to things like that expression I had said at the start of the class, we have, I forget the exact numbers, but it said, uh, 70 to 90 percent passing, let's say on this illustration, uh, we want 70 to 90 percent passing a thousand microns, uh, whatever mesh number that corresponds to. That literally is um, what it says. It says, what is the percentage, cumulative percentage passing a certain size range? That's often a very good number to use. So you'll see numbers like the D80. What is the diameter where 80, which captures 80% or less or below of, of my particle size. So go across 80 and then come down. So my D80 would be go across 80% where that point meets the green line, come down, and then say that's 800 microns. That's my D80 particle size. So 80% of my particles are, are 800 microns or smaller. Uh, so D80, D95 is another one that, that, that's sometimes used. The D80 is most common in the mining industry. Those, those are more reasonable uh, summaries of this distribution. But if you do have to resort to a single mean diameter, one, uh, one way to go about it is to reduce 
one of those theoretical, uh, not theoretical tests, but use one of those calculations. So these calculations for the volume mean diameter and the surface mean diameter, they're available to you in uh, that, that textbook I have referenced on the website, that Cedar and the Roper textbook. Uh, they, they derive what those equations are. And, and they do that for all four cases. So all four of the uh, mean diameters that I've listed over here, you can get the cal calculations for them. The, the, the idea is to use the calculation that matches the situation that you're interested in. So the volume mean diameter would be more appropriate to use if you're looking at particle sizes to cal calculate packing in a column. Or if you're looking at mass transfer applications, then the surface mean diameter uh, would be appropriate. So those that you use that diameter for skin friction calculations or mass transfer calculations. The main concept is the following though. You would pick the mean so that if you could compare two materials that have the same mean diameter, that those two materials would have the same performance in the system. That's the principle we're after. Those two materials would behave the same way, they would have the same performance in, in, in the system that you're concerned about. That, that's a fair estimate of the mean. Here's, here's, a, here's a, an example that illustrates that a bit. Um, here's a two particle size distribution, one very much skewed over to the left, and another one that's got a bit of a more normal distribution, but still with the longer right hand side tail. These two distributions have the same arithmetic mean. Okay? So there's the arithmetic mean at that particular point. The numerical value of that arithmetic mean is identical. But the other means are, 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 are different in this case. Um, but here, these two particle size, that particle size distribution is going to likely have, in some applications, very different performance than this particle size distribution. And so there, the use of the arithmetic mean may not be appropriate. One of the other means that more closely match up would be more suitable to be used. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that and just uh, cover just this one more slide. And just state a lot of this particle size distribution depends on the sample you take. So if you've worked or, or may work in the mining industry or even um, oil fields, there's a lot of sampling that takes place when you're doing exploratory analysis. So if you're developing a new mine or trying to develop a new flow sheet, these companies will apply a sample to, to then design these flow sheets from. There's some there's a lot of things that can go wrong with sampling. A lot of projects have failed because the sampling was done incorrectly, and, and conversely, a lot of projects haven't gone ahead because the sampling uh, showed that it was no, no good when it may have actually been. The key, two key issues of sampling is to take the sample from the entire moving stream, not just a fraction of it. Um, so, take it uh, so firstly, take it from a moving stream, that's the first part, not from a stationary stream, because obviously a stationary stream has a chance to settle. And the second part is to take it from the entire stream for many short periods of time, rather than taking it from a part of the stream for a longer time. So take many small samples from the entire stream, and then base your uh, particle size distribution in the, in the streams on that. So I'll leave it at that, and then.